Okay, students, we're going to talk about carbohydrates. The first part of this should be review, and perhaps all of it will be review. And then what we're going to do is head into my favorite section, which is metabolism. So we will have covered amino acids, proteins, right? Uh, we will have covered fats, and then now carbohydrates. And then we're going to pull it all together to explore how we use uh, carbohydrates and fats uh, for energy and kind of how all of the pathways uh, link together. So I'm excited to be in this particular section. So the simple way of looking at where we're headed is to talk about uh, glucose, C6H12O6. So here's our glucose and that it is undergoing cellular respiration. Um, so reaction with oxygen to form CO2 and water. And on paper, it looks very simple, but yet as we get into the nitty gritty, it's actually a lot of different pathways make that happen. And the whole goal is to produce ATP, which is energy. In a reverse process, plants take CO2 and water to make sugar, and that's photosynthesis. That's something that we don't cover in this particular class. It's kind of its own separate uh, biochemistry from uh, where, what we're studying. Carbohydrates have a lot of different functions. Our goal in this class is going to be to look at it in terms of metabolism, storage, and generation of energy. But uh, carbohydrates play a role in the immune system as far as molecular recognition, in bacterial and plant cell walls for cellular protection, uh, glycoproteins for cell adhesion, and then there are certain types of polysaccharides, uh, sugar, um, polymers, like cellulose and chitin, that maintain biological structures. Monosaccharides are simple sugars from three to nine carbons. Oligosaccharides are formed when you link together monosaccharides uh, with a few of them. So examples would be like a disaccharide with two. And then polysaccharides are polymers formed from many saccharide units. Okay, our most simple monosaccharide will have, saccharides will have three carbons, and those are the trioses. And uh, D-glyceraldehyde is shown here. We'll talk more about what the D means in a moment. And D-glyceraldehyde is an aldose. Aldehyde, so here's our aldehyde group. Do you remember that from our OCHEM? And then uh, it is an equilibrium with its ketose, the ketone group over here. And that equilibrium goes through what's called an indiol intermediate. So this is an equilibrium process. Um, the indiol is very unstable, so it's hard to isolate that and you wouldn't be able to. Uh, but these undergo an equilibrium process between aldose and ketose. Okay, and um, when you have that scenario, um, the aldose and the ketose are what are called tautomers of each other, okay? All right, so let's talk about stereochemistry with the monosaccharides, the trioses. Um, you learned in your OCHEM two different designations for this. Uh, so let's take a look at D-glyceraldehyde. If you look at this carbon here, that carbon has four different groups around it. And so it's going to have a mirror image of each other, of itself, sorry, that is not superimposable. Now the keto shown is not that mirror image. We'll see it here, I believe in the next slide. Um, actually it's between these two here. So these guys would be mirror images of each other. And um, one way, that we describe those mirror images is to use the word enantiomer. An enantiomer is a non-superimposable mirror image. And so how do we designate that? Uh, one of the ways you learned in OCHEM is by the R and S convention, where you uh, assigned a priority to molecules, and then you would uh, count around that carbon and see which direction 
the priority led you. So for example, here, the OH would be our highest priority. And on the next slide, there'll be a list of them. And then the aldehyde would be second, and then this one would be third. And so based on that designation, notice what happens. We count around and our counting is in a clockwise direction. So that enantiomer is designated as R. In the uh, mirror image, the priority is, if we assign the priority, it's going to be in the opposite direction, counterclockwise. And the counterclockwise direction, we would describe it with the S enantiomer. So RNS is one way of describing the stereochemistry of these non-superimposable mirror images called enantiomers. What is interesting about them is that their only property that they differ in is their um, interaction and the direction which they rotate plane polarized light. So they differ in just that one property. So they differ in interactions with plain polarized light. So that's the experimental way of checking for this type of stereoisomer. In other properties, melting points, boiling points, the physical properties we're more used to, they are the same. So in as review, the RNS nomenclature system, you'd have these priority groups. So here's the OH was given a higher priority, uh, right? That was our number one to the aldehyde, which is number two to the uh, alcohol group, which is three. And since we based it, then we would count either, count those up in either a clockwise or counterclockwise position on that enantiomer, and then we designate it either R or S. Okay, so if the groups are going clockwise in terms of the numbers one, two, three, then that would be the R configuration. If they're going counterclockwise, that would be the S configuration. Okay, so that's not the only type of designation to determine uh, stereoisomers and their relationships. Another is uh, the absolute configuration based on crystal structures of deglyceraldehyde. And what was noted based on X-ray diffraction uh, was that the OH is on this side of the carbon. And when it was said to be on that side, it was given the D designation. On the other side, it's given the L designation. So the D and L is an absolute configuration. And um, so that's based on data, experimental data. So when you're given a molecule D and L, that's from empirical data that was collected regarding that molecule. Okay, when we go to a little bit more complicated monosaccharide where the N equals four, meaning four carbons, those are tetroses. Things get more complicated because they're bound to have more than one chiral carbon. So for example, here, highlighted in gray, so the gray here and here, this guy has two chiral centers. And remember, chirality means that it's gonna have four different groups around that carbon. Okay, so with this in mind then, um, things get more complicated. Now, let's take a look, see how it says D. That D is based on this absolute configuration of the OH group on carbon three. That OH is on the same side as the OH in D glyceraldehyde. So let's go back. See here, the OH is on this side of the carbon that has the D designation. So on this guy, the OH is on the same side. So that's given the D designation. 
So coming over here with D erythros, same thing, that OH is on that side. Okay, so I'm going to switch my colored pen. Over here, whoops, for carbon three, uh, the OH is on that other side, so that's why that one's L, and the OH is on this other side for erythro, so that's L. And so that's based on the DNL or based on that carbon three and the location of the OH group. Okay, so um, now let's talk enantiomers. Enantiomers are mirror images of each other. So if you look closely between these two, those are mirror images. Okay, and then these two are mirror images of each other. So those are enantiomers, non-superimposable mirror images of each other. Okay, now with the RNS business, what that would mean is that each of those carbons that are chiral would have their own RNS designation. We don't need to go into that depth, but you would find whether or not it's RS for those two separate carbons. Okay, and then lastly, there's one other uh, discussion here. And I think what I'd like to do is to kind of erase what I've written up so that it's not as confusing. So let me erase that. Okay, there's another term uh, which are called uh, diastereomers. Okay, and uh, diastereomers are optical isomers that are not mere images of each other. And so um, the way that I think of these is to take a look at these two sugars or four sugars in comparison with each other. So like the D and the L three O's are enantiomers to each other and D and L erythros are enantiomers to each other. And so now the question would be, what if we were comparing those two sugars to them, to each other? So the three O's to the erythros. So if we take a look at these guys here, okay, if you notice this carbon three is the same, right? But carbon two are not the same to each other. And so those will still be optimal, I, optical isomers, but they're not mirror images. And they're actually what are called epimers. They differ from each other in the configuration at only one carbo, a chiral carbon. So you see how carbon three is the same between D3-os and d erythros, but carbon two is different. So that would make these guys epimers. Okay, and then between L3-os, and L erythros, if you notice, uh, carbon two is different, right? So they differ in carbon two, so they are epimers. Okay. Hemiacetal and hemiketals are a discussion for us as we take a look at the reactions of carbohydrates. So let's just review. So this should be a review. An aldehyde can react with an alcohol to form a hemiacetal. So you know where we saw this was in our friend serine protease, right? So the alcohol attacks the um, carbonyl group. Okay, so that's a hemiacetal. And then here, this forms, uh, this particular alcohol attacks a ketone to form a hemiketal. So the difference between them is that this first ketone group was within an aldehyde, and this ketone group is a, a true ketone with two carbon groups surrounding it. 
Okay, so an aldehyde reacts with an alcohol to form a hemiacetal. A ketone reacts with an alcohol to form a hemiketal. Okay, so this will be um, something that we look at when it comes to um, our sugars. I'm going to click off of this slide. I'm not a fan of this one. It's, let's go to the next one. Okay, so this is the one that I wanted to go through. A couple of ideas here, and there's a lot. So this is a really important slide. Okay, so this one I'm going to make is a key important slide for you guys. Um, here's glucose, six carbon uh, sugar. It has an aldehyde group here. Okay, and it is uh, going to be able to form uh, a reaction with itself. In other words, I'm going to erase what I just circled. Carbon number five, the alcohol group there, is going to be able to attack that ketone on the aldehyde to form a hemiacetal. Okay, so this is an intramolecular reaction meaning within the molecule. Okay, now what's not shown is that the glucose as a straight chain would be in an equilibrium with its ketose. So it's an aldose here, but it's going to have that side reaction with its ketose through the enol, indiol intermediate. Okay, that's not shown here. What's being shown here is that carbon, the ox, the the alcohol group on carbon five attacks the ketone group on, on the aldehyde. Now, when it comes in for the attack, it can come in in two different directions. It'll form a ring structure, but what will happen, so here it's attacking, see here it's attacking, right? And then these electrons get pushed out Okay, and, and so in this cycliz cyclization reaction, since it can fold either pushing this OH, this O group below the ring that's formed or above the ring that's formed, depending on which direction that OH attacks from. And so on the closed ring structure of glucose, you end up, you can end up with two different types of glucose rings. One where the OH is below the ring and the other where it's above the ring. Okay, now a couple comments on this is that when this one here forms essentially, it's gonna pick up an H, right? To make it the OH. Okay, so it doesn't stay as O minus. Okay, so that doesn't stay that way. And then secondly, then let's take a look. Um, Three-dimensionally, what you want to think of is that this is a, a flat plane and that the ring is flat. And so you have these OHs are below. Anything I'm highlighting here is below the ring that I just put a little dot. Anything that I'm going to highlight in red is above the ring. Now, the only part of this molecule where you can have two possibilities above and below is on this carbon where I put below or above. And then as far as our numbering goes, let me show you the numbering. So that's always going to be carbon one. So it's always carbon one. Everybody else will always have the same 
direction to their OH and H groups. Those never change on, on the rest of the ring. It's only carbon one that can have the OH below or above, and that's because of this attack over here that happened. Now, how would I designate these? First of all, D-glucose. Okay, D-glucose um, is based upon the uh, OH group, right? The D part is on the stereoisomer, uh, comparing it to D-glyceraldehyde. Okay, so the D part isn't changing here with this. And the only thing that's changing is it's going from a straight chain to the ring. So we call the straight chain D-glucose. If we want to reference this ring structure, which is really how we're going to draw it most of the time, uh, that name is glucopyranose. So that's the ring form. And then how will I designate whether or not it's above and below the ring structure for that OH? That's with this alpha or beta. Okay, so the alpha or beta designates that. If it's below, then it's alpha. If it's above the ring, then it's in the beta form. Okay, and then you could write these with the Fisher projection formulas, but to be honest with you, um, what I would like you to know is to be able to write it in straight chain and in the ring form for memory. Okay, so very important slide. So the most common uh, six, six carbon sugars are hexoses, and the most common are glucopyranose, uh, manopyranose, galactopyranose, and fructofuranose. So uh, out of these three, I would say the ones that I want you to know are glucopyranose for sure and fructose. The other two, I would give you their names. Well, let's take a look at why they are how they are. So this is beta because the OH is above the ring. So all of these are showing the beta form on that uh, carbon. Now, uh, fructose is interesting. Let's look at fructose because it's a little different. It has six carbons, but it's a five-membered ring. Fructose will be important to our discussion in metabolism. And uh, one other thing about it, just um, if you can, take a moment to write its structure on your paper so that when we take a look at it uh, in, in another slide, you can kind of know what we're looking at. So it's carbon one is not on the ring, part of the ring, okay? All right. Those of you uh, organic chem enthusiasts uh, will know that uh, car oh, sorry, glucose in a ring structure, there's two different ways that rings can um, uh, adapt spatially. One is what's called the chair configuration and the other is the boat. And then the chair is just a lot more stable from steric hindrances. So, just as a, a kind of a review, because you probably did learn that in OCHEM. Okay, uh, again, here's glucopyranose. This guy is alpha, because it's below, the OH there is below. This guy is beta, because it's above here. This is alpha manopyranose, because of the OH there. And this guy is beta, Alloperanos, and that one's above. So the alpha and the beta, hopefully you see, is in the anomeric carbon. And how would you know that from these? Is that, remember, this O within the ring was the one that attacked as a nucleophile, the aldehyde group. OK, 
Okay, so a summary of the carbohydrate stereochemistry and terminology. Stereoisomers that are mirror images of each other. Okay, um, so in this case, D3OS and L3OS, those are enantiomers, they're mirror images of one another. And then the D and the L reference this OH group here. So that's that discussion. But if you look at these two, they look like they're looking at each other in a mirror, right? Diastereomers are not mirror images of each other. So these two are not because they're epimers. They differ around one of the carbon groups, right? You see how those are... Um, Oops, sorry, not that one. Here, those are okay. But here, uh, these are not mirror images of one another. So they, they differ around one of the carbon groups. Anomers are alpha and beta designations. So our alpha glucose here and our beta here. Okay, and epimers, stereoisomers that differ in conformation at one carbon other than the anomeric carbon. So if you notice here, these are just one of them are on opposite sides of each other. Okay. And this is showing glucose. So here's the chair conformation and the boat conformation. These are conformational isomers. It just can interconvert between the two. And the chair form, because of the steric interactions, is the lowest energy form. OK, I'm going to skip that slide. Um, we talked a little bit about this with this gluco sphingolipids that glucose sphingophospholipids that um, on phosphate glucose can attach so you can have sugars attached to phosphates and in this case this was attached to a lipid in our previous uh, discussions so they can form phosphate esters and uh, this one here showing beta d glucose one phosphate the beta here is because up here it's up above the ring, right? So that's above the ring. So that's why it's beta. Um, there can be sugar derivatives. So um, there are what are called amino sugars. So you see how this looks similar to glucose, but it has the amine group. And uh, this is a kind of famous molecule called uh, glucosamine. It's an alpha D glucosamine. Why the alpha? Because let's look at carbon one here, right below the ring. And then it has it, uh, instead of an OH there, it has an amine group. And that can get ac acetylated, meaning that you can form acetyl group on it. And we might encounter these later in, in later discussions. So just as an FYI, the sugars can be, have slight variations on them. Okay. So let me show you in one more slide, um, just as an FYI that there's some abbreviations for some common monosaccharide residues. I think the important ones on here for us, just so you, in case you see it, so glucose will be GLC, galactose, GAL, fructose, FRU, ribose, RIB. Okay, so... Um, just as an FYI, as we move forward, I think those are the four main ones that you should know. Okay, so let's try to make sense and at one of the Zoom, uh, Zoom lectures, we 
or Zoom discussions, we can uh, practice more writing things. Um, okay, so let's look at what we're looking at. So what will happen is that um, monosaccharides will react with each other to form disaccharides to form a very famous linkage in biochemistry called the glycosidic linkage. I don't think at this point it's a surprise that when they react this way, water comes out. Okay, so the first one there is, its nickname is maltose. It's formed from two alpha D glucose molecules coming together. Okay, so let's look at what happened. Let's count on the first glucose. One, two, three, four, five, six. Second one, one, two, three, four, five, six. So you see how they are linked between the carbon number one of one of them to carbon number four on the other guy. And so the linkage is a one four linkage. That's because they are bonded between carbon number one. My one looks really bad, so I'm gonna try to fix that guy. So carbon number one is linked with carbon number four. Okay, so let's decipher what this is saying. It's saying that alpha D glucopyranosyl. Okay, now that's really alpha D glucopyranose. So in other words, they're both alpha D glucopyranose coming together. They change it to SYL just to designate it as a different one from the second one, like a nomenclature thing. Okay, now why is it alpha? Well, let's come over here and take a look. Notice that this O here ended up below the ring. And since it's below the ring, then the original glucose that it came from must have had that OH below it. Okay, and I'm being lazy and not writing in the rest of them. Okay, so I'm just looking at carbon one. Okay, on the second guy, that one is also alpha D. You see how that one has the OH below. Okay, it has the OH below the ring. Okay, that's why it has the alpha designation there. And then it linked up to carbon that use carbon four though to bond. And you see how this OH would combine with that OH on the first one. Now we're gonna practice this in our Zoom uh, office hours, but what I want you to think about is carbon number one on the first sugar was alpha, so its O was below. And then on sugar number two, it used the OH for carbon four that's always below. That's just the sugar. It's that one's not anomeric. It's always below the ring. So we end up with an alpha D glucose glucopyranosyl in a one four linkage with alpha D glucopyranose. That's really hard to say. So instead we call that guy maltose. Okay, here's another one, sucrose. Alpha D glucopyranosyl 
So here's the glucose essentially. It's alpha, notice that it's this is below the ring. And then it's linked to fructose. Now fructose, look at this is, so I asked you to write that down in your notebooks. One, two. So this guy looks different than perhaps you wrote it because it's flipped around in space. So this is fructose, what I call kind of flipped a little bit, but just your numbering, this guy up here is carbon one and here's two. So if you notice the linkage is a one, two linkage. And that's beta D fructo furanoside. Okay. And uh, so sucrose is a very famous disaccharide. And so I'd be really familiar with its structure. And we'll practice some writing together. Uh, here's another important one, lactose, milk, su the sugar in milk. That's beta D galactopyranosyl in a 1,4 beta D glucopyranose. Now let's take a look at that guy. I just want to highlight something that these guys are betas, right? So if you're looking over here, this OH would have been on the galactose up top. Okay, this OH on glucose is always below the ring. So if I was to draw that, I would have drawn it just a little bit differently. I just want to say, sorry, when I move my computer, it makes a really bad noise on your end. Okay, let me focus here. So here, I won't draw in the rest. This would have been the galact, yeah, the galactose. Just I'm focusing on that carbon there. Okay, so that one's here. And then the glucose. So this is the galactose and this is the glucose. Okay, so what I want you to think is that when they come together to bond here, water's going to come out right? And what you'll end up forming, though, that I think is so important to recognize is that they will end up stacked one above the other. So uh, I don't have a lot of room, so I'll draw it over here. Can you see how they'd end up stacked if water came out? And how do we draw stacked structures? So this would be one on top of the other, right? It's basically, uh, well, they don't want to draw them so much stacked. So instead they use this curve designation. You see that business in the middle there? That's trying to get you to think that those are actually stacked. And then the other part I think is important is that that's beta D glucopyranose. So the, the beta part on this sugar has nothing to do with the linkage. It's, it's just showing you where that OH on the other, on carbon one is ending up. The beta part on the first one is important because it means that it's this guy that's above the, the plane. Okay, we'll do more practice during the Zoom reviews uh, on writing those.
Um, okay, so polysaccharides, um, there's actually a couple that I think are super important. One is to understand that plants store sugars in one way and animals in another, but they're very similar. They're similar. So in plants, we store, uh, plants store glucose as starch. Starch has two different types of polysaccharides. One is amylose and the other is amylopectin. And then the way we store sugar in animal cells is glycogen. So this is showing amylose. So this is a plant uh, polysaccharide, if you notice. Looking closely at the structure, there are alpha-1,4 linkages. And so how do I know that is because it's below the ring. So it would have been alpha on carbon number one. So that's alpha. And then carbon four, again, is always below the ring. So that one doesn't have the anomeric business. So this is an alpha-1,4 linkage. Okay. And so that's amylose. Um, uh, amylopectin is an alpha-1,4 linkage, but also has alpha-1,6 linkages. So let's take a look here at the pick. Here's the alpha-1,4. Okay. And then here is the alpha-1,6 linkage. Couple comments. So let me write that out. Maybe it can help you to visualize what happened there. Okay, so that's carbon one alpha. And then on another glucose, it's reacting with carbon six, which which that CH2OH. See how those guys can or react with each other. Again, water is given off. And what you end up forming there is they're stacked. One's higher than the other one. So, um, so here's our alpha 1,6 linkage. So you end up with what's called a very highly branch structures because they can go up from the chain that's going across as well. So branched structures. So to summarize in plants, the storage monosaccharide is glucose, but it forms in linkages to form amylopectin, which is highly branched and amylose, which is not, is just more straight chained, okay? So you have alpha-1,4 in amylose and in amylopectin, alpha-1,4 plus alpha-1,6, which creates branch structures. Okay, in animals, we store uh, our sugar as glycogen. Number one to know is that our number one place that we store glycogen is in the liver followed by muscles. And one of the things you're gonna learn as we keep moving forward is how important our liver is to metabolism. It's one of the main organs we rely on. So glycogen stored in the liver and a small extent in muscle cells. Okay, so let's take a look at glycogen. Let's see what's up with its structure. It has the alpha-1,4 linkages, and it has the alpha-1,6 branch. So alpha-1,4s all, and this is showing alpha-1,6 as well. There is a huge advantage to having branched structures that I will bring up right now, is that, um, when the hormone signal gets sent, and we talked about glucagon, remember glucagon? It's the hormone that uh, targets the liver that sends the signal release glucose. Okay, when that signal gets sent through that whole G protein phosphorylation cascade that you learned on the last test, 
when that signal gets sent, the, there's enzymes, remember, through protein kinase A, glycogen phosphorylase. So there's a whole series of enzymes that get activated. And the last enzyme is in charge of cleaving this structure to release glucose. Okay, and it's so much easier to release a whole bunch of glucose if it's branched. Okay, think about if it's not branched, you'd only have this end here and this end to start cleaving glucose off. But imagine a highly branched structure, you have this other end, and then this would be more and more branches. So a branch structure allows for a more efficient enzymatic cleavage. So a branch structure allows for more efficient and faster enzymatic cleavage. And what I want you to go back and think about and tie this into our G protein phosphorylation pathway that we just got done studying. Hopefully you didn't forget it already. So one of the key things that hopefully you're learning in biochemistry is structure affects function. And it's a lot better if glycogen is branched so that when that signal gets sent from the hormone glucagon that you need blood sugar because your blood sugar is dropping, that you have a way of quickly cleaving it. The more ends there are, the more, the faster it can go. Okay, the other thing as we look at the structure is just like we've talked a lot is that this structure is extremely polar and it's going to attract water. And so because of that, because it's attracting water, uh, there is a finite amount that can be stored in the liver. So the liver can't accommodate a whole bunch of it because when glycogen is stored, it's bringing water weight in there as well. So this is the opposite of our fat cells. Remember fats with the triacyl glycerols? Those guys exclude water. So you can pack a whole bunch of fat in your adipose cells. Sugar storage is different because this is going to attract, see all those OH groups, right? Very polar. And so when glycogen is stored in the liver, it's, it's going to naturally have some water weight in there with it, which is going to limit how much can be stored. And here's another look at the alpha-1-4, alpha-1-6 glycosidic bonds. Okay. Um, there are structural polysaccharides of cellulose and chitin. These are not part of our metabolism discussion, but I do just want you to note, here's chitin. It has a beta-1-4 linkage. So that's a beta one here. Cellulose, which is a major constituent of plant cell walls, beta one four. Okay, and so um, what you should be noticing here is that in our polysaccharides that are for strength, so chitin cellulose for plant cell walls. The strength ones are end up being polysaccharides that are more like rope-like structures. And um, so those rope-like structures are called microfibrils. And those are linkages that are beta 1,4. So in our energy storage, 
polysaccharides alpha 1,4 and alpha 1,6 dominate in the polysaccharides that are more for strength, like cellulose, beta 1,4 dominates and it creates um, really strong chain like structures. Okay, and those are um, really important because they end up forming like these really thick bundles. So again, the structure affects the properties. Okay, and here's another cellulose structure. I like this picture because it kind of gives you a visual. So in starch and glycogen, so in starch, amylose, just your straight chain alpha 1,4s. And amylopectin, alpha 1,4 and alpha 1,6. Same with glycogen. Those, if you notice, amylopectin and glycogen, similar, correct? Same. And then, uh, but in cellulose, the beta 1, 4 linkages create these like sheet like structures. And that's looking at strength. Whereas over here, this is storage and makes these guys more. Susceptible, susceptible to enzymatic cleavage.